Unit 7, Hot, Hot, Hot. You can access this review and this video on srhschem.wikispaces.com or on my YouTube channel, LaFell Labs. The first question has us looking at an enthalpy diagram, so let's start with some labeling. At the beginning of the reaction pathway, that's the progress of my reaction, we have our reactants. And at the end of the reaction pathway are our products. So chemical reactions have two parts to them. There's a part of the reaction where the reactants have to absorb energy, and then a part of the reaction where we're going to release energy. So if we want to determine if something is endothermic or exothermic, we got to look at the relative amount of energy there. The energy absorbed by the reactants is at the endothermic part of the reaction, and the energy released by the products is the exothermic part of the reaction. So depending on which part is bigger, that dictates whether or not our reaction is overall endothermic or exothermic. So if we were to find the change in enthalpy, we would have to look at the difference in enthalpy between the reactants and the products. So that net energy change is the delta H, the change in enthalpy for our reaction. So if we want to find a numerical value for the heat of reaction, we're going to have to compare the enthalpy of the reactants, which in this case is 150 kilojoules, and the enthalpy of the products, which is 50 kilojoules. So I'm looking for the difference, the change between the two, which means that I'll have to subtract. So whenever I subtract, I get a difference of 100 kilojoules. Now the question is, is this endothermic or is it exothermic? This reaction releases heat, and we know that because the reactants start with higher energy and then go to the products with lower energy. Therefore, I need to apply a negative sign to my delta H for this reaction. So my delta H is negative 100 kilojoules. So now, is this endothermic or exothermic? So we saw that we started with reactants, and then we decreased in enthalpy, and then ended up at the products. So this reaction is exothermic. The products are going to have a lower enthalpy than the reactants, meaning that heat must be released. So we were correct to apply our negative value to our delta H because this is exothermic. We would see the opposite situation if it were endothermic. So we would see the reactants are lower than the products. Compare the stabilities of the products and the reactants. So high energy tends to be less stable and low energy tends to be more stable. So my reactants have higher energy than my products, meaning that the products are going to be more stable than the reactants because they are lower energy. Next question, we have a chemical equation which includes heat as a reactant. So this is the reaction between nitrogen and oxygen. So first question, what is the delta H? So we're looking in the balanced chemical equation itself, and we see that the delta H is 67.8 kilojoules. So is this endothermic or is this exothermic? Heat is a reactant, so just like any other reactant in my chemical equation, I have to have enough of it for a reaction to occur. So heat is being absorbed for this reaction to happen, meaning that the reaction is endothermic. So the sign on delta H will be positive, which is what we have in A, positive 67.8 kilojoules. Now that we've established that, we can do some stoichiometry with our heat in our reaction. So I can write a, almost a mole ratio that includes heat. So what is the change in enthalpy if one mole of nitrogen dioxide is formed? So we'll start off with what we were given, one mole of nitrogen dioxide. And I need to put moles of nitrogen dioxide on bottom. So this is going to come from our balanced equation. In our balanced equation, there are two moles of nitrogen dioxide. And whenever I form two moles of nitrogen dioxide, I need to absorb 67.8 kilojoules. So my answer here is going to be exactly half of 67.8. And this is why my reaction, as it is written in the balanced equation, forms two moles. I'm asking 
What's the delta H for only one mole? Half as much. So our delta H is half as much. So the next question, if a quarter mole of nitrogen reacts, how much heat is absorbed? So we're going to expect an answer that is a quarter of 67.8. So if we had one mole of nitrogen, we would need all 67.8 kilojoules. But I only have a quarter of a mole, so I only need a quarter as much heat. So we'll start out with our quarter mole of nitrogen. And I need to cancel out the mole of nitrogen, so that needs to go on bottom. And I'm trying to get units of heat. So uh, whenever I do my math here, I get positive 16.95. Heat has to be absorbed, and our delta H was positive. The next question, how many grams of nitrogen are required to absorb 156 kilojoules of energy? So this time we're starting with kilojoules. We'll need to cancel those out. We'll need to get to moles of nitrogen and then use molar mass to get to grams of nitrogen. So we'll start off with our 156 kilojoules. This time I want to flip and put kilojoules on bottom. So I'm going to have 67.8 kilojoules, and that is the amount of heat absorbed by one mole of nitrogen. So at this point, my answer would be moles of nitrogen. So we have just one more step, and one mole of nitrogen has a molar mass of 28 grams. So nitrogen is a molar mass of 14, but there's two of them because nitrogen is diatomic. So we get 64.4 grams of nitrogen. Number three is asking us about entropy of a system. So for each of these phase changes, what's happening to the disorder, to the entropy of the system? So if we look at our different states of matter, a gas is going to have the most disorder, and a solid will have the least disorder, and liquid is going to be in between the two. So if ice melts into a liquid, that would be going from solid to liquid, that would be an increase in entropy. We're getting more disorder, more motion, more movement in our particles. Methane crystallizes into a solid, so that's going to be um, something turning to a solid which has less disorder, so we see a decrease in entropy. Solid iodine sublimes into a gas, so we're having solid at least disorder going to gas with most disorder, so that is an increase in entropy. The last one, water condenses on a cold can. So this is talking about water vapor in the air, which is a gas, and whenever it condenses, that means it's becoming a liquid, so that would be a decrease in entropy. Number four, provide an example of a phase change that is endothermic and one that is exothermic. So endothermic means adding heat. So that could be like vaporization, going from a liquid to a gas, or melting, going from a solid to a liquid. Exothermic is any phase change where we have to remove heat for that to happen. So that's going to be the opposite. Condensation is going from a gas to a liquid, or freezing, which is going from a liquid to a solid. The next question provides us with a heating curve for water. So we got some specific heat values for ice, liquid, and steam, and then we also have the heat of fusion and the heat of vaporization for water. So let's focus in on segment AB. So in segment AB, potential energy is constant because kinetic energy is increasing. So we see that we're getting a change in temperature, which means that that heat is being used to speed up those particles. So next we have to calculate the value of Q. So how much heat does it take to go from that starting temperature at A to the temperature at B? So because we have a change in temperature, we know we need to use Q equals MC delta T. So the problem tells you that there were 10 grams of uh, water, and we're going to multiply that by the specific heat. So the value that we're using, that 2.1, during segment A to B, our water is ice. So we need to use the specific heat value for ice. And the change in temperature, we go from negative 15 to 0. 
So that means that 315, 315 joules of energy are being absorbed. The next segment, segment BC, is where we start to see something interesting happening. So this is a phase change, and this would be water going from a solid into a liquid. So that's happening between point BC. So that means that since temperature is constant, the kinetic energy is constant. So because kinetic energy is constant, that means potential energy must be changing. And since this is a heating curve, potential energy is increasing because we're adding heat. That heat is doing something. Instead of raising the temperature, that heat is being used to break apart the attractions that are holding the water together in the state of matter of ice. So to calculate Q here, we need to use the heat of fusion. So the heat of fusion is 334 joules per 1 gram. I have more than 1 gram of ice, which means that I've got more than 334 joules for each gram. So I need to multiply this by the number of grams that I have. So I get 3,340 joules of heat. So in segment AB, we had to absorb some energy. And in BC, we're absorbing a lot more. And that's because that energy needs to break apart those attractions. So we need a pretty big value of Q to accomplish that. The next segment is segment CD. So by the time we get to point C, all of the ice has melted and we are now entirely liquid water and the temperature starts to rise again. So because the temperature is rising, the kinetic energy is increasing. That heat that we are applying to this now liquid water is once again speeding up the motion of the particles, which means because kinetic energy is changing, that potential energy is constant. So to calculate Q, once again, we have a temperature change. So we go from 0 at point C to 100 at point D. So I know I need to use Q equals MC delta T. The mass of my water is still 10 grams. This time we are using the specific heat for liquid water, 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. And our temperature change is 100 degrees Celsius. So I'm heating that water up to its boiling point, and the amount of heat to do that is 4,180 joules. So if I had more water, that number would be bigger. Segment DE, once again, we've hit a plateau, and another phase change is occurring. So the temperature stays constant. It's staying at 100 degrees Celsius. So the heat that I'm adding is not raising the temperature. The heat must be doing something else. And what that heat is doing is it's increasing the potential energy. Those attractions that hold together that liquid water, hold those particles together, those attractions are being broken apart. So the molecules are able to escape the liquid and turn into a gas. So if I want to find Q for segment DE, I'm going to use the heat of vaporization. And I have to take into account that I have more than one gram of water. If I had one gram of water, the amount of heat would be 2,260 joules. But since I have 10 times that amount of number, I need to multiply it by 10. So here we get a really big Q. And the reason for this is because water is very strongly attracted to itself. It takes a lot of heat to break apart those attractions to the point where it can become a gas. Last segment is segment EF. So once again, my temperature is starting to change. So that means that my potential energy is constant and the heat is being used to speed up the particles, so kinetic energy is increasing. So because I have a change in temperature, I know I need to use Q equals MC delta T. So my temperature change this time is going from 100 to 120, and I still have 10 grams of uh, water that is being converted into steam. So I need to use the specific heat of steam because once we get to point E, all of my water has become vapor, has become steam. So I get 380 joules as my amount of heat necessary to take that water between E and F. So if I wanted to calculate the total energy, 
for this entire heating curve, I'd have to go back and add up each segment, and that would give me the total amount of energy to go from negative 15 to 120 for 10 grams of water. Next question is about using bond enthalpies. So the important thing to remember whenever you're doing this is that bond breaking is endothermic and bond forming is exothermic. So I've got a nitrogen to nitrogen triple bond and I've got one of them. And the bond enthalpy, we look that up on a chart, is 941. So I need to multiply across, I get 941 because I'm just multiplying by one. Same thing for the oxygen to oxygen double bond, except that bond enthalpy is 495. So I need to sum those two numbers up. Keep in mind that this is an endothermic uh, change because we are breaking bonds. So that means I have to apply a positive number to my total. Now I'm going to go to the other side of the arrow, to the product side, and do the same thing. So I get a total of 808, and I need to remember that this is exothermic, so I need to apply a negative sign to that total. Now I need to just combine my totals here. So positive 1,436 plus negative 808 gives me a difference of 628 kilojoules. So this is going to be uh, an endothermic reaction overall because the endothermic part for bond breaking was larger than the exothermic part. The next question has us using Hess's law to find the change in enthalpy for a reaction. So I'm trying to get to my blue reaction. I always like to rewrite it. And I need to get there by manipulating those three reactions that are provided to us. So let's start with the first given reaction. I'm going to want to double this reaction. And the reason I know that is because I've got 2NO and I'd like to have 4NO. So I'm going to need to double this reaction in order to achieve that. So if I double the reaction, I've got to double the delta H. The next reaction, I need to double it and I need to flip it. So I need to flip it because I need NH3 as a reactant. So that means that I'm going to have to flip that around. And I've only got two NH3 and I'd like to have four. So I'm going to need to also double this one. So there's my reaction flipped and doubled. So since I flipped it, that negative 91.8 becomes positive 91.8. And then I'm going to have to double it to 183.6 kilojoules. My last reaction, I need to triple. And the reason why is because of that water. So if I look at my water, I have two H2O, and in my blue reaction, I have six. So that means I'm going to need to triple it to get two to six. So because I tripled my reaction, I triple my delta H. So at this point, um, that's going to work out really well, because I need to cancel out those six H2s. I don't want that in my final blue equation. And it's going to let me get to five O2. So now we can cancel. So the two N2s cancel, and the six H2s cancel, and that looks like that's it. So now we need to check what we have against our blue reaction. So first, 4NH3 appears, that's good. Next, we've got our 5O2. So those 2O2 plus those 3O2 give me my 5O2. On the other side of the arrow, I should have 4NO, which I do, and 6H2O, which I do. So at this point, we've accounted for everything, and we've ended up back at our blue equation. So to find my delta H, I just need to sum up all of the delta H's that we have from the reactions that we manipulated. So I get a delta H of negative 1,628.2 kilojoules. Next question is asking about heat flow. So I've got two blocks, one is at 100 Celsius and another is at 200 Celsius. So heat energy always flows from warm to cool. So the direction of the heat flow is going to be from the warmer block to the cooler block. This will continue until both blocks are at the same temperature. So we'll see that heat exchange occurring. 
So it might be if these blocks were in isolation, it might be whenever they're both at 150. But if they're not in isolation, if they're like sitting on a desk, it's going to be once the heat has been exchanged so that they're all at room temperature. So in the reaction oxygen plus energy, it's going to give me an oxygen molecule and an oxygen molecule. So we want to look at what's happening during this reaction to the energy. So first, it should be very obvious since we're going from O2 to two separate O's that a bond is being broken. So we see that double bond on the O2 is being broken. So we've got an oxygen and an oxygen without any bonds. So in order for this to happen, energy is a reactant, meaning that energy needs to be absorbed for this to happen. Here's some hints for ways to find uh, delta H. So the first way is to do an experiment. So we can measure delta T, solve for Q, and remember that Q is equal to enthalpy when pressure is constant. So this would be similar to the lab that we did where we found the heat of neutralization between one molar NaOH and one molar HCl. I could ask you to just solve a problem. So this could be a stoichiometry type problem where I'm giving you heat as a reactant or as a product. You can write mole ratios with the heat. I could ask you to solve for Q. So just using Q equals MC delta T. I would have to give you the specific heat of whatever substance you're being asked about. I could ask for the heat that is absorbed or released during a phase change. So I would have to give you the heat of fusion or the heat of vaporization in order for you to calculate that. Or I could ask you to calculate specific heat. So I'd have to give you Q and I'd have to give you M and I'd have to give you delta T so you could solve for C. The other type of problem could be from Hess's law. So we would have to combine two or more reactions to find an unknown delta H. There is also standard heat of formation. So this is the enthalpy to create a compound from its elements in standard state. So if I have carbon dioxide that was made from the element carbon and the element oxygen. So we would have to find the enthalpy of the products, add them all together, and then subtract them from the total enthalpy of the reactants. So you would need a table that had standard heats of formation so you could find the sums of reactants and products. Number five involves bond enthalpies. So this is where we could look at a Lewis structure and determine the bonds that are breaking and forming. So bonds that are breaking are going to be endothermic and bonds that are forming are exothermic. So we have to add the endothermic value to the exothermic value to get the overall change, making sure that we apply the correct sign to each of those. Last way you could do it would be just from an enthalpy diagram. So you need to find the difference between reactants and products using the y-axis. And if the products are higher, the reaction's absorbing heat, so it's endothermic. If the reactants are higher, the reaction has to lose heat, which makes it exothermic.